So for a long time here in the United States, we had a pretty simple view of sex and gender. There was male and there was female, and that was pretty much it. And those were, you know, men were male and women were female. And that was pretty much it. And we knew that uh, the men were really on top for a long time. Right? Men were the dominant um, part of that power structure in our society for, for a long, long time. Eventually, we made a huge leap, right, and came to embrace androgyny, which is, you know, that men can sometimes maybe express their emotions and maybe have emotions, right? And women can be in charge of things or, you know, just more in terms of a crossover between what we traditionally saw as masculine and feminine, that men uh, can, in fact, demonstrate some traits that would be considered traditionally feminine and vice versa. Women are allowed to um, to display some traits that would consider, be traditionally considered masculine. And that was a huge leap forward. You know, that only took, uh, you know, a couple hundred years for us to really start to embrace androgyny in a sense, in that in that sense of, of things. Um, but of course, eventually, uh, we came to acknowledge really that women have as much value in society as men. And that really led to the exploration in the role of media in advancing, deterring, and framing this reality, this idea that, that women are equivalent to men, as we came to, to understand. And so, um, so then how does the media factor into that, factor into our understanding of that, factor into advancing that, factor into diminishing that idea, and so forth, just all of it. So um, that led, of course, then to the um, exploration of um, of feminist uh, analysis, which we're, again, I, I want to really clarify that we're not here to argue the politics of feminism, whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether it's reality, whether it's not, whether it's, you know, better for our society or not. We're not here to argue those uh, politics, really, but to consider the perspective of feminism in the context of media. Okay, that's really what we're here to do. So we're here to put on that critical, uh, those critical lenses, that critical uh, framework of feminist analysis and really consider that now that now that we do understand that, that women are, are as valuable as men to society. They're an equal part and, uh, and equal partners in our society. And, and uh, so we're going to explore feminist analysis in the way that that plays out in the media. So for definitional purposes, feminist analysis examines artifacts using a framework that considers the ways in which an article or artifact, excuse me, reinforces or undermines the economic, political, social, and psychological oppression of women. Again, not here to argue the politics of this, um, but rather to explore the idea then, okay, women have been subjugated to men for a couple hundred years. We're going to take on that premise and, uh, and explore media through that particular lens and see how media works to do these things in economic, political, social, and psychological uh, ways. Okay. So, that's our mindset right now. So the history of feminist analysis really comes in three waves. There, there are three waves of feminism here in the United States. So we're going to look at, at each of these just briefly so we have some understanding of what we're talking about here when we say feminism. The first wave really took place between the late 1700s and the early 1900s. So the start of the United States as a country up till the early 1900s. Uh, and really, that was just some general attention drawn to the inequality of the sexes. I'm drawing some attention to the fact that, you know, men were really very much in power during those times, really did have the upper hand. Um, women were, were seen very much as secondary considerations, not as capable, not as strong, not as qualified as men. And, uh, and that, that, that really was represented in the United States by what we call the women's suffrage movement which brought attention to the fact that women were not allowed to vote, were not allowed to really do much of anything, not not technically own property in many parts of the country for, for large portions of that time. We're not allowed to, you know, have ownership of these different things, um, except through their husbands or the, the men in their family or whatever, you know, that was passed down through the men. So women really had no standing, no rights during that time. And so that was just bringing attention to that. The first wave of feminism was just to say, look, this is not fair. We don't have any standing, any rights in this country. And yet we are expected to do all these things and we are capable and we are, we are, you know, should have some um, consideration in that regard. So then in the, uh, the, the second wave really comes in a, in a much shorter period of time, the, the early 60s, early 1960s into the late 1970s. So that, you know, around two decades or so, those 20 years 
really are where um, we saw, first of all, World War II demonstrated the ability of women to work equally with men. So preceding that, you had, again, all the men in World War II went off to, to fight in the war. So that left women here to do really all the work that men had been doing and give them the opportunity to say, look, we can do this. We are capable of doing all the things that men do. Um, it's just that we haven't been given the opportunity to do so. But World War II really provided that opportunity for them to demonstrate that they can. Then that coincides you know, later on by picking up steam then from from uh, demonstrating that through World War II. Then in the 60s and 70s, um, this coincided with the civil rights movement in the United States and really allowed women to step forward along with um, this idea of civil rights for, our, for minorities and codifying those rights for minorities. Women were able to step forward and say, look, this is us too. You know, we should, we should be included in this conversation. And, um, and you know, the good news is in some ways that was easier for people to swallow here in the United States in some sense, right? It didn't feel, I guess, as for the, for the people who were in power, it didn't feel as threatening, I suppose, um, as you know, the, the rights of minorities did. So, um, women were able to make strong advancements in, in this idea of feminism, um, made a lot of advancements during that second wave during those decades of the sixties and seventies here in the United States. Then the third wave of feminism came in the early 1990s and really extends into present day. And here we see an emphasis on marginalized women. So by that, we mean women of color, women in lower economic classes. So not just women as a whole. That was that was, you know, the early parts of feminism were just women, period, full stop. Women deserve these rights. Women should have equal standing. Women should have protection under the law for these things. Um, so that was just all women. But then, of course, even after that, you had Certain women who, after those things were, were recognized and granted, certain women were able to access them more easily than others. So this third wave of feminism starting in the early 1990s has focused on, you know, not just women specifically, but but women in particular who have been marginalized within that movement. Even so, right, women of color, women from lower economic status, um, economic classes who may not have the money to to pursue or to press these kinds of advantages. So. So you have women in these different um, um, subsets that are really starting to to be recognized and to uh, to push for their own recognition and rights within that. So we had these three waves of feminism, and so now that's just a very very you know in a nutshell type of history of feminism and uh, and delivered by a you know very privileged middle-class white guy. So um, take that all with a grain of salt uh, and do your own exploration of those things, certainly by all means, but just trying to give you some understanding of, of that framework then. So the major premises and how this relates to feminist analysis, where this comes from then are, first of all, that women are oppressed by the patriarchy. Feminist analysis for our understanding, for our exploration of this, we need to take that on, take that mindset on. Again, setting aside the politics, whether or not we we think that's true, whether or not that's something that is part of our own belief system. For our purposes of study here and, and for analysis, we need to be able to put on that lens, that framework of women are oppressed by the patriarchy, that women have traditionally been subjugated to men in terms of power and opportunity and those types of things. And so women are oppressed by the patriarchy is the primary premises here. Then this idea that Western culture is deeply rooted in patriarchal ideology. So that uh, that our country really was, I mean, when we talk about it, the history of our country, right, we talk about the founding fathers. We don't talk about the, the founding parents or the founding mothers or whatever, you know, we talk about the founding fathers and everything that was really developed within that is developed really to advantage men because men were in control. Men could own things. Men could do things. Men could vote. And so even deeply rooted in our history is this idea that men are obviously better than women and superior to women and should have those rights and, and advantages, right? So Western culture is deeply rooted in that patriarchal ideology that, that, uh, that uh, privileges men over women. While sex is determined by biology, gender is determined by culture. So sex is a biological thing and it's a, it's a physical thing. It's very clear, very, very transparent male and female. That's what we mean when we talk about sex. But when we talk about gender, we know that that is determined. It's that's a, that's a social construct. Gender is a social construct. What is appropriately masculine? What is appropriately feminine? What is in between there? What is not a part of any of that? What, where, where does all that fall on that spectrum? That is all determined by our culture. 
and the culture decides, you know, really what's appropriate for what gender. So we need to distinguish between those things as well. It's sex is determined by biology. Gender is determined by culture. And then gender issues, which is uh, at the heart of feminism, gender issues play a part in every aspect of human uh, production and experience, including the production and experience of media artifacts, right? So the media that we're looking at was um, created by someone with some idea and some belief and some uh, sense of purpose and value and things. And those are all informed by gender issues. They were created by a person or persons who, uh, you know, ascribe to subscribe to a particular gender who see that gender as a part of themselves. And so that then informs every aspect of our lives, including what we create and what we um, take in as as media, what we view as media and the different artifacts that we see. Okay, so gender plays a part and it has a role in all of that, the production, in the experience of those things and everything. So, okay, those are the major premises of feminist analysis. So those are the things that's, that inform this framework. So some of the questions that we might see as part of from feminist analysis and might want to consider as part of feminist analysis include things like, how is the relationship between men and women portrayed in this artifact? So just basically, how are they... How are they uh, uh, laid out here? How's the how are the how are the characters portrayed? How are, how do they relate to one another? Um, and what you know, visual perspective are they provided in this artifact, or or what kind of language are they using, and so forth? What is the relationship between men and women here? Uh, what are the power relationships between men and women, or characters assuming male and female roles? So even if it's, you know, men playing women or women playing men or whatever, whoever's playing those male or female gender identified roles, what are the power relationships like between those people? Does one person in that relationship have more power than the other? And how is that portrayed? How are the male and female roles defined then? Right? So how are we using gender as a part of this? Uh, how, how is, how are, you know, how is masculinity defined and portrayed? How is femininity defined and portrayed? And how is the, everything in between there portrayed? What constitutes masculinity and femininity as it's portrayed here in the, in the artifact? And how do the characters embody those traits? Uh, do the characters take on traits from opposite genders? So if somebody is, is uh, the character has been portrayed primarily as masculine, do they take on some feminine traits? They display that kind of androgyny there and vice versa. Does it, do the feminine characters take on masculine traits? How so? And how does that change the other's reactions to them? So when you see uh, a masculine character take on a feminine trait, how do the others relate to that? Do they look down on it? Do they think it's weird? Do they, do they accept it? Is it not just a part of the, 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 the conversation at all? Uh, what are the reactions to that? What does the work reveal about the operations? Those operations we talked about before, economically, politically, socially, socially, and psychologically of patriarchy. Does it, does it confirm the patriarchy? Does it go against the patriarchy? Does it, it try to tear it down? What is, how does it relate to the, the patriarchy then in those operations in this work? What is the history of the work's reception by the public and the critics tell us about the operation of the patriarchy? So when people see this, if they see that it conforms and confirms the patriarchy, do they approve of that? Do they, do they disapprove of it or vice versa? If somebody sees something that is contrary to the patriarchy, do they, do they like that? Do they not like it? Do they accept it? Do they promote it? Whatever. Uh, and what role does the work play in terms of women's artistic history and artistic tradition? So how does this contribute to and play into the uh, work of our art, uh, uh, women's artistic work in the, in the, in our society? Okay. So we want to take a quick look at, uh, at an example of this and try and apply this. I'm um, just in an artifact that I've chosen. And so this is going to be, again, a mile wide and an inch deep. We're going to try and answer all those questions very, very quickly and very briefly. So this is not an in-depth analysis, but just to give me an idea of what this might look like. So I've chosen a very popular artifact uh, for this examination, uh, the Harry Potter world. We're just going to call it the world of Harry Potter, you know, the books, the movies. We're not going to distinguish between the two, really. Um, and so we're just going to look at the world of Harry Potter that was created and uh, and how it's portrayed in those things. And those are different things. I mean, the books were obviously very specifically written by women. Um, the movies were, though, produced and developed by both men and women. They were directed, I believe, by all men. And so, there, I mean, there are different um, people that had 
you know, the fingers on this different uh, world at different uh, stages and different in different ways. But we're just going to kind of look at it generally here. So we're going to look at the world of Harry Potter. And hopefully that's uh, one you're familiar with, at least uh, if, you, if you're not, you know, totally enveloped by it, then you've then you've you're familiar enough to, to know the reference. And so some common questions go back through these common questions that we just looked at. How is the relationship between men and women portrayed? Well, it's portrayed um, in a fairly traditional way, I think, a fairly typical way, a stereotypical way that we would think of. Um, first of all, the pro protagonist is a man, of course, so we're focusing on uh, men, pri a man pri primarily here. Um, the, the men and women, because of the setting as much as anything, are um, very kind of separated. They live in different uh, dorm areas and they live in different, you know, they're, they're housed separately because they're at a boarding school. And that's, that kind of makes sense. But there's a very, you know, kind of stark di distinction between men and women, a fairly traditional um, roles, I think, in display of men and women in this uh, in the series um, how are the power what power relationships are there between men and women or, or characters assuming male and female roles again this is focused on a male protagonist so the power relationship is primarily in men in fact you look at them the people who have the most power in in this series are the men um, you, the, the headmaster of the school is a man at least for the, the primary portions of the the story here um the the, the main headmaster was, a, was male the the certainly the the evil kind of the big evil in the in the series was a male in in voldemort um and i'm not afraid to say his name but uh, in voldemort you had a male um, power there um, and uh so and even just a within the school you look at most of the powerful characters and obviously harry's a male two out of the three primary characters are male um the 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 big teachers you had were, were mostly male I and mean, you could make a case from Gonagall, although I would argue that she takes on a lot of masculine characteristics. So even though she's female, she really takes on a lot of masculine characters. So, so it's just the power in the, in the story is primarily resides within people who are either male and or masculine. I would say. So even if even the women who are really portrayed as having power, take on those masculine traits. If you look at the, the later headmaster, right, the evil one, uh, the, the teacher who then becomes headmaster later, um, that is, uh, is female, but she really takes on a lot of masculine traits. McGonagall the same way. Even Hermione really takes on many masculine traits, what we would call masculine traits. So the power relationships tend to be pretty traditional in that, in that the male or masculine um, power um, folks tend to be in control tend to have the power within that story uh, how are the male and female roles defined again very traditionally there's a very distinct um, difference between the the men or boys and the women or girls in the story um, there's not really a lot of crossover um, we know of course if we if we really examine this from the author we know that that she tends to have and has has indicated that she has kind of uh what I guess you would define as transphobic views in terms of she's not uh, she does not approve of um, of the trans uh, world or lifestyle and uh, and the, that kind of transsexual idea. So it's not surprising that it's not really evident in in the work here that it that, that it is while there's some um, uh, women that cross over into masculine territory. There's not really a lot of men who cross into that feminine you know that femininity a lot. Uh, but uh, uh, and and so there and there's certainly no I don't think real distinction or there is very much a distinction between the sexes when we talk about male or female it's very clearly defined. What constitutes masculinity and femininity and how do the characters embody these traits? Again, I would say it's pretty traditional. I've kind of talked about this a little bit. I think what we would con traditionally consider masculine is what is portrayed here: that it is direct, that it is powerful, that it is in control and in command, and and uh, and those types of things, um, whereas femininity is more concerned with emotion and and uh, and and kind of physical um, uh, attributes and things like that. When you think about most of the feminine characters in here, again, Hermione kind of is at the very least androgynous, if not masculine. So when we look at the other, a lot of the other primary characters that are female or feminine here they are largely concerned with does this boy like me like me what do i look like does my is my dress pretty for this formal occasion or whatever those types of things so it's you know pretty 
typical um, feminine type things, um, except except those females who are taking on the masculine traits. So pretty traditional in that regard. I've kind of kind of belabored that point a little bit already. So some other common questions we have: Do characters take on traits from opposite genders? I kind of talked about this. Yeah, there is some of that um, that it's uh, that, it, but it's primarily women taking on more masculine traits. And as far as the views and, the, and how it changes the others' reactions to them, it's not great. I mean, it's not really. When you think about how a lot of the different people relate to Herm Hermione, excluding Harry himself, but even Ron a little bit is is a little bit put off at times by how boyish she is, how masculine she is, how in control and in command she is, and kind of questions his power and authority, right? And certainly the other people around don't care for that at all. When you look at the other characters, Draco and his group there, they really don't like Hermione in the way that she is, you know, considers herself. She's confident. She's powerful. She takes command. She does well at things that really boys should be good at, right? And so it's not great when, when people take on those traits. They're not viewed really well, but they do it sometimes. And, and, you know, and it's, it's viewed positively by the audience, I think, but, uh, but a pretty traditional take on it in terms of the way the work is portrayed. Uh, what does the work reveal about the operations of the patriarchy? I mean, I think it reveals the really traditional sense of the patriarchy in full effect. Men are in control, men are in power, women should take their cues from men and be led by men, and you know, men own own the shops, own the money, or in the positions of power primarily, right? Um, so we look at it in all of those senses, economically, politically, socially, psychologically. I think it's a very traditional perspective on the patriarchy and, uh, and reinforces, in essence, the, what the patriarchy is. Uh, what does the history of the work's reception by the public and critics tell us about the operation of the patriarchy? I think it tells us that we're comfortable with it, that we're used to the patriarchy in that regard, that, that, that it's a comfortable story in the sense of it doesn't really contradict a lot of those things, although it does give us just enough of the modern idea of feminism with Hermione being a strong character and really showing the boys what's what really is the best at a lot of the things they do. I mean, should she be the primary character here in the story? <laughs> Maybe she deserves her own story. I think that uh, she's that powerful a character. So what does it tell us about, about the reception though, that we like the, I think that we like the safety of what we're used to, what we're accustomed to, and that it conforms to the patriarchy in that regard, but gives us just enough, you know, moments of, yeah, women can do things too. Uh, so a lot with Hermione. And then of course, with Mrs. Weasley at the end, it, so spoiler alert, if you, and this has been out a long time, so I think I'm safe here, but spoiler alert, when, when uh, Jenny is under attack, right? When Jenny is, is being attacked at the, in the final battle and, uh, and Mrs. Weasley comes in and storms in and, you know, not my daughter, you, whatever, takes a strong stand and really protects her and comes up strong there. And, and in a lot of ways, Mrs. Weasley shows some, I think, some masculine characteristics. So we like that too, that she's independent, she's capable, she's whatever, but also that they're still portrayed within the safety of the patriarchy. Mrs. Weasley is primarily a concerned mother and a housekeeper and a, you know, a, a loving, caring, emotive type of uh, character, except she does have that strength too within. And so, um, so we like that that's safe as well, I think. So there's, there's very traditional patriarchy displayed with just enough taste of the uh, sort of the, the second wave, I guess, of feminism um, to, to, to make us feel like, yeah, this is kind of progressive, but not really, um, not really challenging too much of what we are comfortable with. Uh, what role does this play in, in terms of women's artistic history and artistic tradition? Well, I mean, a lot has been made out of the fact that this series was created by a woman and about her circumstances. You know, if you're familiar with that, that she was a single mom who didn't really have a lot economically. It was kind of on a, in a welfare type situation when she wrote this and, and then obviously became extremely successful. So it's, it's been a real um, uh, boon for, I think, you know, the, the idea that women can be creative, women can do whatever, and, and has, has had a significant role within that. Uh, although I think, again, the work and the author themselves are kind of safe within our traditional understanding of the patriarchy. And, and so kind of mixed bag there in terms of feminism um, that, yeah, it was written and created by a woman and, a woman, and that's fantastic. But that woman, woman is fairly traditional and, uh, and, and the work itself is fairly traditional and safe and comfortable. And that made it, um, I think, more broadly popular, more broadly accessible to people, too, that it didn't challenge a lot of those things. So so kind of a mixed bag there. But um, anyway, so that's just a quick rundown, a quick analysis of uh, Harry Potter in terms of feminist analysis. So I hope this gives you some idea of what we're looking at with feminist analysis and a better idea of 
uh, what goes into that and how to how to lay that framework of feminist analysis over an artifact and that the next time you view an, uh, uh, any artifact it'll give you a new perspective on what it might indicate about the traditional perspectives of the patriarchy and uh, current ideas of feminism and feminist analysis if you have questions about feminist analysis or about any other kind of critical media studies and or, or anything at all related to this, please feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from you there. In the meantime, I hope that you have enjoyed this discussion and that you will continue to broaden your perspective in terms of the frameworks and the, the critical lenses that you have in your tool belt as we continue to be critical analysts of media in our society.